morning all of you and uh, welcome to a new semester. Um, so this semester uh, the course convective heat transfer is being offered uh, by myself and Professor Ajit Kolar from the heat transfer and thermal power laboratory of uh, our department of mechanical engineering and uh, uh, so this is primarily targeted towards uh, research students uh, who are pursuing their MS and PhD in the area of uh, um, convective heat transfer and apart from uh, them the regular uh, undergraduates who are in their senior year and who are interested um, to uh, get more uh, deep insight about convective heat transfer apart from their basic heat transfer course they had taken in their uh, pre-final year uh, they are also welcome to take this course. Uh, so to just begin with uh, so since today is an introductory class we will uh, uh, take look at the uh, basics of uh, the fundamentals of uh, what this course has to offer um, and uh, let us look at some of the um, uh, you know applications where convective heat transfer is used also um, to give an idea about uh, um, the uh, problems that uh, we will be looking at uh, depending on the classification um, that we will be following okay. So, so this is uh, the objective of uh, this particular course um, as you all know this uh, the field of uh, convective heat transfer I would say is a symbiosis between uh, two important subjects one is uh, fluid mechanics or fluid dynamics and the other being heat transfer and uh, if you um, look at uh, the aspects common aspects of uh, fluid mechanics so that is basically offering uh, what is called as the advection uh, to heat transport and that is what uh, the convective heat transport uh, heat transfer is all about and uh, naturally since the advection process is uh, non-linear and uh, uh, this brings in uh, the complex nature of uh, the interaction between the flow and the heat transport in many cases the flow and heat transport are usually coupled and uh, typically if you are looking at uh, say the buoyancy driven flows so there the uh, temperature and or the energy equation is coupled to the momentum equations and so on so there is a complex nature in the interactions between the momentum and the energy equations which makes this course a lot more interesting uh, and also more challenging to learn and uh, so this course would benefit those students who are particularly interested to pursue um, their research in a related area. Now uh, I have also written down a set of learning outcomes um, according to the Bloom's taxonomy as you all know Bloom's taxonomy is used all over the world to classify the different levels of a learning process um, so there are totally six levels uh, according to the uh, modern Bloom's taxonomy the highest level being uh, creativity and uh, if you can guess the lowest level so that is uh, basically um, uh, recollecting uh, what you have memorized okay so uh, we as we go from the lowest level uh, uh, as you had progressed from your uh, from your school education where your emphasis was mostly on the uh, remembering or the recollection part that is the lowest level and we will move on uh, as you progress in your uh, courses uh, here at IIT as well as uh, doing related uh, research work that you will uh, go several steps in the uh, hierarchy of the Bloom's taxonomy and finally be able to reach the highest level which is the creativity. So according to the different levels I have classified the outcomes of uh, the learning process in this course um, I would say the one of the important learning outcomes would be to first you should be able to differentiate and distinguish between the different modes of convective heat transfer. So you all know that uh, your conventional heat transfer consists of uh, primarily three modes that is your conduction, convection and radiation even within convective heat transfer you can uh, classify different modes based on the classification of flows and uh, um, the regime with uh, which you are dealing with. So you could look at uh, things like forced convection uh, or buoyancy driven convection which is called the natural convection or free convection 
then depending on whether the Reynolds number is less than a critical Reynolds number you can look at uh, flows which are uh, laminar or uh, flows which uh, become unstable and transition and finally become turbulent and depending on the flow configuration whether they are internal or external uh, boundary layers. So, so this, this part of differentiation and distinguishing between the different modes of convective heat transfer would be on the level of analyzing. So this is on a pretty moderately high level that is your level number 4 on the Bloom's taxonomy. And apart from that so you will be able to uh, derive all the fundamental governing equations of mass, momentum and energy and also we should be able to um, describe what approximations are being used when we uh, apply them in the um, solution to say the boundary layer equations for example. So these analytical solutions are uh, for, uh, determined from your actual Navier-Stokes equations based on certain approximations and you will be able to understand how to derive these equations and also the approximations involved. So that will be on the level 2 which is an the understanding level. The third objective will be to analyze the solution methodologies that you have uh, derived analytically either by using uh, similarity uh, which is the exact technique or the approximate technique which is basically the integral method and you will be applying this to solve for both external as well as internal forced convective heat transfer. So this will be on the level of applying and analyzing that is involving both levels 3 and 4 and uh, the objective number 4 would be to solve related convective heat transfer problems. Um, this, this is more on the applying level and I think uh, most of you in your heat transfer course have already done this where you are given a set of uh, heat transfer correlations um, and then you just uh, use that um, either you use the correlations or you use available charts uh, to solve problems so that will be on the level of applying on level 3 and finally uh, you will be not just uh, doing the uh, understanding or applying or analyzing but you will have to go a, a little bit higher in the uh, hierarchy of the Bloom's taxonomy to level number 5 which is to evaluate so in that uh, you will be um, given a computer based assignment and also some of your regular assignments will involve um, numerical solution to uh, uh, some of the equations the ordinary differential equations um, that you will be uh, solving and uh, by applying these numerical techniques you will be able to um, um, evaluate your understanding as far as uh, this course is concerned. So on a particular application level so you have a certain problem to solve and also uh, apart from that to enhance your uh, fundamental understanding you can also supplement them with um, doing rigorous numerical solutions okay which will be given as a project at the end of this uh, course as well as um, the regular assignments which will also involve numerical aspects. So this will take you to the level of evaluation which is level number 5 okay. I hope uh, by doing all this uh, this will be very useful for uh, your research work which will probably utilize your final level of the Bloom's taxonomy that is your creativity. So coming to the course content of this course so this is a very structured course and uh, um, it's, a, it's pretty rigorous and time consuming we have to cover quite a lot of topics um, within the given span of 42 hours and therefore it's a pretty intensive course and we will start with the con governing equations we will look at the derivation of the governing con equations which are the continuity momentum and the energy equations. Uh, primary, primarily we will look at the Cartesian coordinate system and uh, you can uh, do these derivations uh, with a similar analogy in the other coordinate system such as the cylindrical and the spherical. We will also look at the approximations that we can make to the full set of uh, governing equations and reduce them to amenable form which we can solve uh, during the regular lecture hours. So these are uh, typically something like the boundary layer approximations where we will be able to reduce the full complexity into something which we can uh, where we can find analytical solutions. So we will look at the boundary layer approximations to momentum and energy. So this will take about 6 hours, uh, 6 lecture hours. 
the next uh, topic that we will be looking at will be the laminar external flow and heat transfer. So in this first we will look at the similarity solutions uh, for flat plate which is popularly referred to as the Blasius solution named after uh, Blasius who first uh, came up with the solution and we will extend this Blasius solution to uh, flows including pr pressure gradients which are called the Faulkner scan solutions and if you have a heat transfer problem uh, with adverse pressure gradient it is referred to as Eckert solutions. We will also look at uh, the flows with transpiration also in this course and these are some of the exact solutions we can uh, supplement the exact solutions by reducing the complexity in so solution by means of uh, the approximate methods called the integral methods. So we will apply integral methods for uh, the above problems including the flows with and without the pressure gradients and uh, for the flows with pressure gradient this technique is called the von Karman Paulhausen method. So about 10 hours of uh, lectures will be spent on the laminar external heat transfer part and the next one will be the laminar internal flow and heat transfer which will involve the exact solutions to the Navier-Stokes equations for flow through channels, circular pipes. We will be looking at different regimes of uh, internal uh, heat transfer which starts from your uh, the simplest one will be to look at the fully developed both thermally and hydrodynamically uh, fully developed uh, flows uh, with different wall boundary conditions and we we'll look at slightly more complicated solutions which in which uh, the hydro, it is hydrodynamically fully developed that is the velocity profiles remain invariant of the distance downstream but um, there is a change in the thermal boundary layer. So that is your thermal entrance region of the ducts and these are called as the great solutions and uh, of course you know uh, we will also ap apply the approximate solutions to these problems. So this will again take about 10 hours and uh, the, la the, uh, the last about uh, 15 hours or so we will spend time on the natural convective heat transfer which is a, a very unique uh, uh, problem and we will also look at some similarity solutions and if possible integral method for natural convection. So turbulent convection is a very challenging task you know we have to start talking about uh, how the, uh, the equations uh, representing the turbulence uh, flow and heat transfer are to be modeled. So we'll, we can start off with uh, the derivation of what is called as the Reynolds average Navier-Stokes equation and then uh, we will list out the analogies between uh, heat and mass transfer. The, some of the famous analogies are Reynolds, Prandtl, Taylor and von Karman analogies and uh, we will look at very briefly about the turbulence models if time permits and finally we will look at uh, the empirical correlations because most of the, um, the heat transfer problems cannot be solved analytically in turbulent uh, convection and therefore uh, quite a few empirical correlations are existing for different configurations. So this uh, two topics will take about 14 hours and, uh, and as, a, as a special topic uh, we can look at high speed flows uh, which could be covered with the laminar external flow and heat transfer and as I said uh, there will be a project involving the application of numerical techniques so it could be either finite difference method or finite volume methods uh, to taking up a problem uh, in convective heat transfer. So coming to the textbooks. Uh, there are quite a few textbooks available uh, for this uh, subject. The most important ones which I will be following here I have uh, listed them as uh, the textbooks. The Convective Heat and Mass Transfer by Case and Crawford is an excellent text um, just been uh, followed uh, for several decades as a classroom teaching aid to this course. Uh, Convective Heat Transfer by Kakach and Yener is a pedagogical style uh, textbook for this course where all the detailed derivations have been explained to a great extent. Um, the text by Bejan on convective heat transfer, convection heat transfer is also uh, a good textbook uh, especially in the parts where Bejan proposes a simple scaling analysis uh, for external boundary layer flows rather than going through uh, complicated uh, uh, derivations to understand the nature of boundary layer thickness and so on. Uh, also Bejan is credited with uh, coming out with uh, his own uh, theories uh, primarily the on heat lines 
that is one thing and on entropy generation the analysis of entropy generation due to heat transport convective heat transport and using constructal theory for um, design of heat exchangers and so on. So Bejan is of course an authority in uh, this particular subject and he has his contributions towards uh, um, understanding through scaling analysis is particularly uh, quite uh, 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 interesting for students uh, and coming to the references a uh, few references uh, uh, have listed here are from uh, one of them uh, which is uh, introduction to convective heat transfer by Ustuizen and Naylor. So this is a free ebook which is available uh, and you can probably just download and read it and this has also a good description of some of the numerical methods used in the convective heat transfer. Of course your fundamental text on heat transfer by Incropera will always be very handy in this course and coming to the grading pattern so I wanted to distribute the grading pattern uniformly in all the um, assignments and the project uh, as well as your uh, exams so that is how I distributed them in this manner your quiz has a weightage of 15 percent each uh, for the two quizzes so it is about 30 percent totally and uh, coming to the assignments so we will be given about six assignments including uh, some of the assignments which where you need to apply numerical methods. So that will be a given weightage of 15 percent and your final project will carry about 15 percent weightage and your end semester will be about 40 percent. So totally so you have uh, out of 100 percent you have a equitable distribution in the assignments in the project and slightly higher weightage is given to your end semester examination okay. So let us get into the introduction of uh, this course um, as you all know that uh, there are different modes of heat transport um, which you have uh, come across in your basic heat transfer course. Um, so rather than going through uh, explaining conduction radiation and convection in the uh, usual way I will take a more contemporary path so this is a graphic from uh, um, an online textbook which is the heat transfer by John Leonhardt uh, a very nice illustration here uh, with which you can completely understand the basic three modes of heat transfer. So here you can uh, see that uh, there is a barn or uh, there is a house which is on fire in some countryside where you do not have uh, say access to a, a fire engine very quickly. So a group of people are trying to douse the fire and uh, uh, you can see the numbering 1 is given to a person who is uh, actually pumping water from a well through a hose and directly uh, pour, uh, 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 pouring this water over the barn and trying to douse the fire whereas number 2 is given to a set of people who are uh, using buckets to pull water out of the well and then uh, successively passing this bucket to the other person and finally the person who is closest to the barn will be uh, reaching it to the fire and uh, there is another guy who is uh, really smart here uh, who is physically fit and then he is capable of uh, carrying water all the way from uh, the well to the barn by himself running around and then uh, trying to uh, douse the fire. So there are three sets of processes which are happening uh, to douse the fire here and as you can see that process number 2 here ref refers to the conduction process in heat transfer. So essentially this is happening due to uh, the collision between uh, the molecules in a particular medium and here it is uh, something like an exchange or transport of uh, heat uh, between the different persons or different molecules uh, who are participating in this medium um, in this way you can see that the, the process is uh, slightly slower than processes 1 and 3 uh, because essentially it has to depend on um, passing the uh, bucket of water from one person to the other in a sequential manner. So this is a slightly slower process uh, so the time taken for dousing the fire will be longer whereas if you look at process number 3 so this is similar to your advection process. So in, in the in when you look at convective heat transfer essentially you have processes 2 and 3 happening simultaneously where there is a background uh, effect of uh, diffusion or conduction through the medium by wherein the heat is transported and apart from that due to the bulk motion 
or you know here as you can see due to the uh, the, the motion of uh, this particular person from the well to the barn uh, you could also achieve uh, efficient heat transport okay so this is a combination of 2 and 3. Now if you look at radiation that is similar to the process number 1 where you do not rely on any medium to transport but you directly uh, you can transport uh, heat even uh, in the presence of uh, you know in the mediumless uh, case even in, a, uh, in the outside, uh, outside of the earth's atmosphere. So in this case uh, it is direct uh, ballistic transport from one surface to the other like the way you see the uh, process number 1 where the uh, hose pipe is being used to uh, directly target uh, the flame. So this is uh, very effective uh, provided uh, it can reach from the well all the way up to the barn. So the radiation is something similar to that uh, so it does not uh, require any medium in fact uh, using a medium will impede the quality of heat transport by radiation. So it is a purely electromagnetic phenomena and it can perfectly work uh, in any media including vacuum and it in fact works best without any participating media. So this is how you can look at the 3 processes and three mo relate them to the 3 modes of heat transfer and uh, in fact you cannot really say that a particular mode is always uh, important because if you look at any real life process for example if you boil water in a pan all the 3 modes of convection, conduction and radiation happen to act simultaneously. But when you, when you look at uh, the process involving uh, the water as such and decouple that from the, the uh, process involving the heating of the pan due to conduction and radiation then you can isolate convection as the dominant mode and you can study that separately. So in this particular course we will be concentrating on this uh, mode where you have both advection coupled with uh, your uh, conduction which is a background heat transfer mode always happening. Before going further we have to be clear about a few definitions that we will be using in this course. So first we will be looking at the definition of heat flux so which we will be defining as the heat transfer rate per unit surface area and uh, according to the Fourier's law of conduction your uh, heat flux can be related to the gradient of temperature as minus k dt by dy uh, at if you are applying uh, the Fourier's law at the wall so we define the wall heat flux uh, as minus k which is uh, k, kf is the thermal conductivity of the fluid times the gradient of the temperature uh, at the wall so that, that is at y equal to 0. So if you consider flow past a flat plate here if you assume uh, that you have a, a free stream velocity u infinity and a free stream temperature t infinity approaching the plate and once the flow encounters this plate you will find a growth of what is called as a boundary layer and which is gradually growing in thickness as it goes downstream and therefore accordingly you will have a development of uh, the velocity and the temperature profiles gradually. So this boundary layer uh, is uh, attributed to the no slip boundary condition at the wall where the fluid uh, has to be uh, taking the velocity of the solid here which is stationary and therefore the fluid has to be at rest and essentially the, the lower layers of the fluid has lower momentum compared to the higher layers of the fluid and this gives rise to the concept of boundary layer and if you look at the profiles uh, of velocity you can see that they keep changing and the gradient of the velocity being highest at the near the leading edge and as you go downstream the gradients become more and more benign. Similarly associated with um, the velocity gradients you see the development of uh, temperature gradients so you see temperature profiles which are also changing uh, downstream at any location downstream at any axial location say here uh, if you draw the temperature profile if you assume that the plate is heated therefore the wall temperature is greater than the free stream temperature this is how the temperature profile comes out to be and from this you can define the heat flux at the wall okay so that is minus k dt by dy at y equal to 0 that is the gradient of this temperature at y equal to 0 at the surface and 
Um, the good thing about this uh, flat plate boundary layer problem is it is very interesting and more fundamental when you develop uh, what we call a similarity solutions. So the, if you define a non-dimensional temperature theta and plot that you will find this, this non-dimensional temperature is a function of uh, both the x coordinate that is your axial distance along the plate as well as the y coordinate or the height across the plate. Now if you plot these profiles you found you find that it is a it is a dependent it is dependent on both x and y however if you define what is called as a similarity variable which is a combination of uh, both y and x you can reduce uh, the dependence of theta on a single variable which is a similarity variable eta okay. So therefore you can transform your dependence on the two coordinate systems x and y into a single non-dimensional coordinate system eta which is the similarity variable and therefore wherever you plot whichever axial location you will find that the uh, variation of uh, theta with respect to the eta is, is the same. So this is uh, something which is uh, very unique uh, to similarity solutions and which we will be looking at later on in this course. Now coming to the definition of heat transfer coefficient so whenever we look at convective problems we want to define the rate of heat transport from the surface and uh, we do this by defining what is called as a heat transfer coefficient which is defined as the ratio of the heat transfer rate from the surface to the temperature difference. The temperature difference usually is uh, between the wall temperature and some reference temperature in the case of external flows we will use the free stream temperature T infinity as your reference temperature. So your uh, heat flux at the wall is essentially minus k dt by dy at y equal to 0 and divided by T wall minus T ref which is your T infinity. So you can consider two cases, uh, two cases where you apply a uh, for example a constant isothermal uh, temperature boundary condition to the wall and in one case that is uh, on the left where you see a temperature profile like in the case of a flat plate flow uh, where you see a continuous decrease in the temperature as you increase the uh, y distance um, in this case if you define your heat transfer coefficient in this manner minus k dt by dy at y equal to 0 by t wall minus t infinity you find that the gradient dt by dy is continuously uh, decreasing with increasing y and therefore this will be negative and negative so this becomes positive and therefore your heat transfer coefficient comes out to be positive whereas on the right hand side if you have a flow situation where the wall temperature T, T wall is actually greater than your T reference but you can have a, 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 you can have a jet of a hot fluid which is actually greater than T wall but uh, uh, <coughs> Which, which is uh, greater than T wall as well as greater than your T infinity which is blown over the surface and due to this you can have a temperature profile distorted in this manner. So where if you now take the temperature gradient you find that at the wall uh, the uh, DT by DY is actually positive with uh, Y and therefore you will find that uh, the value whereas your the denominator you find your T infinity is still less than your TW. So therefore the denominator is positive and the numerator will be negative. So in that particular situation your heat transfer coefficient will actually be negative. So therefore contrary to the popular belief that you encounter uh, where you encounter problems with uh, positive heat transfer coefficients when you define your heat transfer coefficient in, the, in this particular manner it could be both positive or negative depending on how the near wall temperature gradient behaves okay. So for all these you should uh, be able to define a reference temperature uh, depending on whether it is an external flow or internal flow and you should also have an idea of uh, the fluid property typically the thermal conductivity. So having defined uh, your uh, wall heat flux and the heat transfer coefficient for convective heat transfer let us look at some of the applications of uh, convective heat transport so typically wherever you encounter heat exchangers where the heat is transferred between two fluids two moving fluids so there you are talking about convective heat transport. So 
you could uh, look at for example in your air conditioners where fin type of heat exchangers are being used and uh, there is a flow past these uh, fins from outside where air cools down the working fluid through this passing through these tubes and uh, so this is uh, one type of heat exchanger um, where you have uh, internal flow through these tubes where the working fluid flows through the tubes and then you have external flow that is the air come going across the fins placed outside the tubes and if you look at uh, heat exchangers in your automotive applications for example in radiator cooling so that is one good example of a compact heat exchanger where you have a very high surface area to volume ratio and there you are uh, also um, looking at external flows that is flow of air over the um, the heat exchanger here you can also look at uh, things like phase change material based heat exchangers where essentially you have a cyclic process in one half of the cycle you pass the hot fluid through a, 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 a porous uh, membrane which could actually melt upon heating whereby they take the latent heat of uh, melting from the hot fluid and then stores it as a capacitor and in the next half of the cycle the cold fluid flows through this uh, medium and then um, this releases the heat back to the cold fluid where the cold fluid gets heated and in the process of uh, losing the heat um, the phase change again happens from the liquid to the solid phase so it solidifies so the material as such repeatedly uh, melts and solidifies continuously depending on whether you are using the hot fluid or cold fluid and therefore can indirectly transport the heat from the hot fluid to the cold fluid of course you are also looking at heat exchanges for example in solar panels also in other industries like chemical industries or any process industry requires uh, heat exchanges where you transfer heat from uh, uh, say your uh, uh, hot gases in a, in a furnace where say combustion is happening to the working fluid uh, which is water mostly in the process industries to generate steam for all that process requirement. So therefore convective heat transfer is present uh, in uh, many instances and uh, most of the heat exchangers require a very in depth knowledge of uh, the convective heat transport. So when you look at the solutions to convective heat transfer we are mostly concerned here with the bulk fluid motion and um, so anything that affects the bulk flow influences your heat transfer coefficient um, effectively so and also the mass transfer coefficient okay here I call the mass transfer coefficient as G and heat transfer coefficient as H. Now in order to um, derive uh, relations for heat finding the heat transfer and the mass transfer coefficients as a function of the uh, flow properties as well as the uh, uh, the properties as well as the uh, uh, the flow we have to look at the complete solution of uh, partial differential equations governing the mass momentum and energy transfer now not all these now, now the, uh, the complete solution of course has to be numerical they have to be time dependent however we can see that uh, in many instances we can reduce the uh, equations to uh, forms which are amenable to analytical and approximate solutions and in some cases uh, this cannot be done and therefore you have to look at a full numerical solution to these equations and uh, if you if you want to do this uh, numerical solution you need to look at boundary conditions uh, for a particular problem and that is done by using the computational fluid dynamic techniques therefore the scope of the subject is very vast if you want to look at uh, uh, more accurate solutions to complex configurations we go for the complete solutions uh, numerical solutions to the governing equations using CFD techniques however if you want to restrict that to simpler configurations we can reduce them to um, equations where we can do the analytical solutions okay so that, therefore the scope is very vast and we have to be uh, looking uh, at both these aspects as, as in a classroom we will look at uh, the fundamental configurations uh, more and uh, once you go to uh, doing research in this particular area you look at uh, uh, solving them numerically. So now we can start looking at the different classifications of uh, uh, convective heat transfer one of the most important classifications uh, which is followed is uh, classifying the regimes of uh, heat transfer into either forced 
or what is called the free or natural convection. So typically you can look at this particular figure uh, which illustrates the idea of forced convection so where you use a fan or a blower to blow fluid over a plate which is heated to cool it down so this is a very intuitive thing which all of us practice it every day. Now if you use a large scale pump or a blower you need a substantial pumping power uh, to pump the fluid past the surface and therefore uh, you need a mechanical aid to drive the convection process. So this is called as the forced convection so where the fluid motion is caused by external means and here to um, characterize the flow we use what is called the Reynolds number which is the ratio of the inertial force to the viscous force which is uh, defined based on the characteristic dimension of the heat transfer object okay and the density viscosity here are defined with respect to the free stream properties or maybe the average properties between the surface and the free stream temperatures and V is the velocity of the fluid. Now this is one category of uh, uh, flows which we will be looking at in the initial part of the course and most of the times uh, there are flows where you do not have to put any effort or you do not have to really drive them and they happen all by themselves and this happens due to density differences um, essentially if you have a stationary media and then you uh, have a temperature difference so this will cause uh, um, the fluid near the higher temperature surface to become lighter and rise up and the fluid near the cold surface to become heavier uh, relative to the hot fluid and uh, they move down and therefore there is a convection current which is set up and in this process you have a bulk motion of the fluid arising out of the temperature differences. So this is called as a free convection or natural convection and we cannot use the concept of Reynolds number here because essentially we do not really push the air by means of uh, uh, an external uh, pumping device so therefore here we define another non dimensional number to characterize the strength of natural convection by means of Grashof number. So Grashof number is uh, the ratio of the buoyancy force to the viscous force so in the case of Reynolds number we use the definition of uh, uh, inertial force to the viscous force so here the inertia is being replaced by the strength of the buoyancy force which is related to the temperature difference between the hot side and the cold side and so typically you can look at free convection which is uh, happening in your uh, uh, when you boil a liquid uh, you do not boil it too much you just during the initial stages of boiling when you apply lower heat fluxes you can you can find these convection currents happening from the heated surface at the bottom and rising upwards towards the cold surface outside so these are like small currents which are being set up and which can improve the heat transport. Now there are cases uh, cases in real life where both the uh, regimes are equally important and that is called the mixed convection which is characterized by the ratio of Grashof number to Reynolds number square uh, also called the Richardson number and depending on the range of Richardson number if you are looking at Richardson number between 0.1 to 1 so this is called the mixed convection regime if you look at very high Richardson numbers much greater than 1 so they are the natural convection is dominant over the force convection so that, that is your natural convection regime and for very small values of Richardson number where your Reynolds numbers are more dominant than your Grashof number that is your force convection regime. So you depending on the values of Grashof number and Reynolds number we can look at uh, classification uh, based on forced free or mixed convection regimes. Now the other important classification is based on uh, if you are looking at forced convection then your characteristic uh, class uh, char the characteristic Reynolds number is your Reynolds uh, characteristic uh, number dimensionless number is your Reynolds number and for values of Reynolds number uh, typically for external for internal flows where you have say flow through ducts or channels uh, the critical Reynolds number is somewhere like 2200 and if you have uh, your Reynolds number is less than the critical value typically you find a very orderly uh, behavior of flow in a streamlined pattern this is uh, similar to what Reynolds did in his experiment in his dye experiment where he injected dye into the flow of fluid and then varied the Reynolds number and see the path of the path taken by the dye so you can visualize and see exactly 
uh, the, the path of the dye according to the, the fluid behavior. So in the case of low discharge where your Reynolds numbers were less than your critical Reynolds number he found a very orderly streamlined pattern of the uh, dye and uh, which is basically the nature of laminar flows and once the Reynolds number approaches the critical Reynolds number of 2200 so there was uh, instabilities in the fluid which uh, resulted in uh, the dye pattern being a little bit irregular and this is the marking the transition of the flow from lamina towards the turbulent regime. So at Reynolds numbers greater than the critical value you find that there is a lot of chaotic motion in the fluid and a lot of mixing happening and therefore the dye diffuses into the fluid completely. This is the nature of turbulent flow so, so when you look at heat transfer again you, can, you have to look at the laminar heat transfer separately from the turbulent heat transfer because uh, of uh, essential nature of high diffusion happening in the turbulence uh, which is not present in the laminar case. So you can again classify your convective heat transfer based on the flow classification of whether you are looking at incompressible flows or compressible flows if you are uh, looking at liquids and also if you are looking at low Mach numbers primarily less than 0.3 then you can assume that density is a constant practically or whatever is it is it is a function of only temperature and when you are looking at compressible flows uh, so compressible compressible fluids are gases so therefore a compressible flow can happen in compressible fluids and usually this is also important when you consider high Mach numbers greater than 0 0.3 and in which uh, you have to consider density as a function of both pressure and temperature and there has to be a local variation of uh, density so the, so so in our course we will be primarily looking at uh, application of heat trans convective heat transfer to the incompressible flow regime. The, the, there are many other classifications so I am highlighting here all the important classifications of uh, heat transport based on the uh, flow classification once again you can look at uh, convective heat transport depending on whether you are talking about a wall bounded flow or a free flow. In the case of a free flow like the jet flow that you see here you do not have uh, a classical boundary layer uh, due to the presence of a solid object um, however you have a, a, a velocity profiles which are changing downstream due to the diffusion due to the entrainment of uh, the surrounding uh, air in a surrounding fluid into uh, the fluid that which is uh, flowing as a jet and uh, once again depending on whether this is a laminar or a turbulent case you can find the instabilities uh, and the diffusion process completely affected. Uh, by these cases and in the case of uh, wall bounded flows you clearly see a boundary layer due to the uh, presence of the solid objects the walls and you could also look at uh, locations where you have a clear demarcation between the viscous effects near the walls and the inviscid effects away from the walls or where you find uh, the merging of the two boundary layers from the top and the bottom uh, walls and then you have a completely viscous dominated flows. So these are uh, classified as wall bounded flows and again you can talk about internal uh, wall bounded flows or external wall bounded flows for example you have flow past a flat plate or a circular cylinder so the, if you look at the boundary layer growing across uh, downstream of this particular object so you are talking about external wall bounded flow and away far away downstream this is called the wake region here. Um, where the boundary layer theory cannot be applied and the flow separates and then again you have a variation in the velocity profiles in the wake region so these are called as the wake flows. So in this particular course we will be focusing on wall bounded flows to a great detail because uh, as such uh, again focusing on jet flows and wake flows would be very exhaustive and we do not have a sufficient number of lecture hours so we will focus particularly on external uh, wall flows as well as the internal wall bounded flows. So coming to the wall flows again you can talk about two classifications one which is called a boundary layer kind of a flow as I said due to the flow of uh, 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 fluid past a solid object uh, due to the difference in the momenta near the wall and uh, in the free stream you can have this rapid growth of a boundary layer where the velocity profiles keep changing locations downstream of the plate and however in this case uh, you can clearly separate the region with where the viscous effects are dominant within the boundary layer 
and outside the boundary layer where the viscous effects can be neglected and the flow can be treated as potential flows. So here the, the nature of the equations is that there is a one way influence uh, from the uh, leading edge of the plate downstream and these kind of equations are called parabolic equations where predominantly unidirectional influence of the flow is seen and these are called as the boundary layer kind of flows. Now if you look at uh, flows with adverse pressure gradients or where you have sharp corners like the figure right here so you can have flow which uh, cannot flow across uh, the sharp corners and therefore has to separate and that is a recirculating bubble here. So in the case of recirculating flows now you cannot say that uh, the, the flow here in the recirculation is dependent on the flow upstream and therefore there is no predominant flow direction here however there is a two way influence. So the equations here are governed by um, your form of the equations which are elliptic in nature and therefore um, uh, the disturbance comes from over all the directions uh, into this particular uh, corner here. So if you look at uh, two kinds of uh, wall bounded flows one is your where your boundary layer theory can be used such as in this case and the other case in the recirculating case where the boundary layer loses meaning once the flow separates and recirculates. You, you can also classify your uh, heat transfer depending on whether you are looking at only single phase or multi phase problems. Um, so this course we will be focusing primarily on single phase heat transfer uh, however you should be also aware that uh, in most of the cases uh, two phase flows uh, are very important and two phase heat transfer itself is a separate, separate uh, subject uh, course by itself. Um, so typically you encounter two phase flows in a variety of uh, places such as where, where you have phase change happening such as in evaporators, condensers, um, in boiling water reactors, in your uh, nuclear power, nuclear uh, power generation, in fluidized bed dry, dry, uh, dryers or uh, uh, fluidized combustion etc. So typically if you look at uh, adiabatic two phase flows where you change the flow rates of uh, the uh, vapor uh, or the gas and the flow rates of the liquid you can encounter different regimes of two phase flows which are uh, going from say dispersed bubbly flow to all the way up to annular flow with droplets. So in one case you have a very low uh, a mass fraction or volume fraction of uh, vapor in uh, this case and if you go towards the right you have a very high mass fraction or volume fraction of uh, vapor and you have very small volume fraction of the liquid droplets which are dispersed within the vapor. So these are the different transitions which are happening when you change the relative superficial velocity of uh, uh, the, uh, the gas with respect to the liquid and of course they have their own complex physics which is uh, still uh, not completely understood and a lot of research is ongoing. The other classification of uh, convective heat transfer will be depending on whether you are looking at flows which are um, in a particular conduit like the case here where you have flow through a particular duct where the two boundary layers from the walls uh, if you are looking at two dimensional uh, uh, plane ducts there are boundary layers growing from the top and the bottom of the duct uh, and finally they merge together and the, uh, the complete region is viscous dominated. So these are called as internal flows. In the case of external flows you have boundary layer growth from the surface and you can very clearly distinguish the viscous uh, dominated effects within the boundary layer to um, the inviscid or potential flow effects outside the boundary layer. So we can also look at uh, heat transfer problems separately where you have a boundary layer approximations valid for external heat transfer uh, separately from the cases where uh, you do not have a boundary layer kind of a uh, equation when you look at the completely fully developed flows and internal flows and depending on again the computational uh, uh, simplicity you can uh, take flows which are one dimensional in nature um, typically where you just look at only the variation in the axial direction you do not look at the variation in the other direction uh, other directions this, this is the one dimensional flows and uh, the other uh, will be your two dimensional flows where you look at variation both in the axial as well as the vertical direction. There are flows are actually three dimensional in nature where you have variation in all the xyz directions and um, therefore uh, more complicated if you look at them. In this particular course we will focus mostly on the nature of two dimensional flows. 
So therefore to summarize what is the scope of the present course we since we have looked at the classification of a convective heat transfer into based on the flow regimes based on the geometry and based on whether you are talking about single or two phase flows we will decide what is the going to be the scope of the present course so we will look at forced convection and free convection both and we will also look at both laminar and turbulent flows and primarily we will be focusing only on incompressible flows here or incompressible fluids and we will be restricting our understanding to a wall bounded flows and also only in the boundary layer regions not in the recirculating regions. Again our focus will be on single phase flows and the two phase flow is a separate course by itself which we will not be covering here and our scope will be restricted to 1D and 2 dimensional flows. So the flow situations which are covered in bold letters will be covered of course I think this is a mistake here there should be free convection should also be in bold and therefore these situations will be covered in this particular course. So we will stop here for today and in the next class tomorrow we will start off with the fundamental governing equations and we will start deriving the governing equations one after the other. Thank you.